Hi everybody. Um, in this video, we're going to be focusing on Newton's third law of motion. Um, so this third law is, for my money, the most interesting of the three laws. Um, it is another one that's incredibly counterintuitive. It sounds very simple, but it actually doesn't really mean what a lot of people think it means. Um, once you wrap your head around it, actually a lot of things in the world around you, just everyday life things, uh, start to make a lot more sense. Um, so let me first state Newton's third law in my own words. Um, the way people usually state it, I find is very hard to understand and, and leads to a lot of misconceptions. So let me, let me try to state it in my own way. Um, we have these forces between objects that we've developed in Newton's first law and Newton's second law, right? The third law says that if um, object A exerts a force on object B, then object B also exerts a force on object A, first of all. Um, so in other words, um, forces always come in pairs. You cannot exert a force on something without that thing exerting a force back on you. So interactions in the universe are never unilateral is basically what we're saying here. They're always mutual between two interacting objects. So there's never actually, you know, we like to think of there being kind of philosophically in life. There's kind of the actor and the one who's getting acted upon. There's like the active one and the passive one. But Newton's third law is telling us that that's actually not the case, that all interactions are mutual. Um, that if I push on something, that something is pushing on me as well. So there's a weird kind of symmetry in interactions where I cannot exert a force on something without it exerting a force back on me. And conversely, if I want something to exert a force on me, I can make that happen by exerting a force on it, which we'll come back to shortly. Now, furthermore, not only does object B exert a force on back on object A, um, but these forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Um, and one thing that's very surprising about this is that the forces are actually equal in magnitude. This is often one part of Newton's third law, which is very counterintuitive, is that Again, we like to think that one of the objects is gonna be stronger than the other one. Like for instance, if I punch the wall and put a hole in the wall, I like to think, oh, well, I hit the wall and because the wall you know, crumbled or something, that means I must have hit it so hard. But guess what? The harder you hit the wall, the harder the wall hits back. And, and maybe, for instance, you might break your hand when you hit the wall. Because if I hit the wall, the wall also hits me. And furthermore, the wall hits me just as hard as I hit it. So the harder I hit, the harder I am hit back. Um, so the forces are, are equal in magnitude. Um, let me discuss some cases where either this is incredibly useful and illustrative or cases where it's very counterintuitive and interesting. Um, so let me flip over to, I'm gonna flip over to a PowerPoint presentation that I use in my gen ed physics class because I have some good animations that I prepared for that one. Um, so here's a good one that's on your screen now with the baseball player. Um, so, that, so you see there, uh, baseball player bunting, right? And when we think about this kind of process, we like to think, oh, okay, the baseball player is hitting the ball. And as per Newton's second law, because he's hitting the ball, 
the velocity of the ball is changing. And that all makes perfect sense. What I want to focus on here, where Newton's third law comes into play, watch his bat during this process. Watch the bat. What happens to the bat during this process? Newton's third law tells us that because the ball is exerting a force on the bat, I mean, because the bat is exerting a force on the ball, the ball is also exerting a force on the bat in the opposite direction. So just as the bat hits the ball forward, the ball hits the bat backwards. And so you'll notice that the bat gets pushed backwards by the ball, just as the ball gets pushed forwards by the bat. So that's the kind of mutual interaction we're talking about. Even in a case like this, where it looks like the interaction is unilateral, it actually isn't that the, the, the bat actually recoils backwards. And you can feel this, of course, in, in baseball and a lot of other sports, tennis or you know any sport where you're kind of like hitting a ball with a bat or a racket or whatever the case may be. When you hit the ball, you can feel the reverberation from that in your hand. And you know, if you're not, if you don't have a tight grip on your, your bat or your stick, it can fly out of your hand from the impact, right? Because when I hit the ball, the ball also hits me. And that's kind of the essence of, of what Newton's third law is all about. Another great example is guns recoiling. Um, this, is, this is an example where you can see very, very vividly the Newton's third law reaction to what's going on. Um, so with a gun, the way a gun works is it exerts a force on the bullet, which causes the bullet to fly out of the gun, right? The bullet has an extremely high acceleration to get it up to a high speed. And so the, bull, you know, the gun has to exert a pretty strong force on the bullet. Newton's third law says, I don't care how that gun is designed. It could be a musket, it could be a modern uh, you know, gun, it could be some futuristic rail gun or some crazy advanced technology that we don't even have a name for yet. I don't care how that gun works. If it works by exerting a force on the bullet that causes the bullet to come out forwards, that means the bullet also exerts a force on the gun backwards. And that's why guns recoil. Guns always recoil doesn't matter how they're designed, doesn't matter what's going on with them, there must be a recoil in every gun. Because if the gun pushes the bullet forward, the bullet pushes the gun backward. So that's Newton's third law. There's another gun recoiling animation just for fun. All right, one of my favorites. I already talked about this when you hit the wall. Another great example of Newton's third law is vehicles. This is a place where it becomes very practical. You can actually understand how a lot of vehicles and propulsion methods, and also in sports context, how we move ourselves forward. Newton's third law has really strong implications for that. A really clear example is like in the slide here with a rowboat. You know, how do you move a rowboat forward? And the answer is that you push the water in the opposite direction from the way you want to go. And you know, you can see that in the animation there if you can't quite picture it. So if you want the boat to go to the right, you push the water to the left. Why does that work? Why does pushing the water to the left cause the boat go to the right? And you can see the answer in Newton's third law. If I exert a force on the water to the left, the water will exert a reaction force back on me pointing to the right. So if I want to go to the right, I should push something else to the left. See, and that work, you know, that again is totally irrespective of how the boat actually works. If you want that boat to get accelerated to the right, it has to exert a force on something to the left. So in the case of a rowboat, you're pushing on the water, you know, in the case of like an airplane, the airplane is pushing on the air to get its forward propulsion. In the case of, you know, different kinds of vehicles might be achieving that in a little bit of a different way, but you have to be pushing on something to get pushed forward. There's no such thing as a perfectly self-contained propulsion method. 
because in order for the, the vehicle to get pushed forward, it has to push something else backwards because the force to push the vehicle forwards has to have a reaction. Um, another example of this from kind of a more sportsy context is like, for instance, how do we move our own bodies forward? Like if I wanna run or in the context of like sports technique, if I wanna run faster, how do I do that? So the way that we run is we push on the ground in the opposite direction from the direction we wanna go. So if I want to move forwards, I need to push backwards on the ground. So then we have various like techniques for how runners should stand and how they should plant their feet and how they should move their legs in such a way that they can push on the ground so that the force has a significant backwards component to it so that the force of the ground pushing you forwards also has a significant forward component to it. Um, and uh, you know, this is why like, you, it's really hard to run on a slippery surface because on a slippery surface, you know, there's not so much force between you and the ground. Um, and you, know, you can't push on the ground and the ground can't push on you. That's the idea of like, you have to have traction. Or like if you know, a, a car is uh, you know, stuck on, on the ice or something, the car can't get traction with the road so the car is not able to exert a force on the road. As a result, the road doesn't exert a forward force on the car. Um, same is true for jumping also in sports like basketball. Like how can you jump higher? What are you actually doing when you jump? At the most fundamental level, what you're doing when you jump is you're basically kicking the ground. You're pushing the ground downward. And the harder you push down on the ground, the harder the ground will push you up and launch you upwards. Um, so all these things, you know, the way that we move our bodies around involves how we interact with the world around us and how we push off of the world around us. Um, okay. A few other details um, about Newton's third law conceptually um, that are worth mentioning that I wanna just highlight specifically. Um, okay, things to notice about this, things that might be a little bit counterintuitive. Um, first of all, the third law pair, as it's called, the pair of forces that is predicted by Newton's third law, you'll notice that one of the forces is by object A on object B, and the other one is by object B on object A. And that is something which is generally true about Newton's third law, that the subject and object of the force are switched in the third law pair. That's a good way to be able to quickly remember and identify third law pairs, is like if you're searching for a third law pair, like say you wanna know, like a good conceptual example that sometimes confuses people is like the force of gravity. You know, what is the third law pair for the force of gravity? Gravity is the force of the earth pulling you downwards. If you use this idea, gravity is the force of the earth pulling you downwards, the force by the earth on you. So that means the third law pair for gravity is a force that's exerted by you on the earth and it must be upwards because it has to be in the opposite direction. So in other words, the earth pulls you down, but also you pull the earth up equally hard as a matter of fact. Um, but of course the acceleration is not the same. Also, well actually I should note this in a separate line here because this is another thing that confuses people about Newton's third law. So another thing to notice is the uh, magnitude of the force is equal in the third law. But this does not mean that the magnitude of the acceleration caused will necessarily be the same. 
because remember it's F equals MA. So the force is the same on both objects in Newton's third law. The force of the earth on me is actually equal to the force of me on the earth, which sounds crazy that I'm actually pulling the earth just as hard as the earth is pulling me because we want to think of the earth as being stronger than me and able to exert a stronger force than me but that's the wrong way to think about it the earth is pulling me down equally hard as i'm pulling the earth up but that does not mean that the earth is falling upwards as fast as i am falling downwards because the force is the same but f equals ma so the acceleration is not the same the, ex the mass of the earth is so much larger than my mass that the forces I would need to exert on it to actually move it in any significant way would be gigantic. So the earth is actually only exerting a relatively small force on me to hold me down. So the amount of force I exert back on the earth is practically negligible when you think about how big the earth's mass is. And that's why things don't always look symmetrical in Newton's third law. The force is symmetrical. The force is equal in magnitude, um, but the effect is not necessarily equal in magnitude. Um, so let me say that again. Um, the effect caused by third law is not necessarily equal in magnitude. Because the effect is more like the change in motion. Um, another good example of that is we talked about recoil of guns. You know, the recoil force on the gun is equally strong to the force the gun exerts on the bullet. So then why does the bullet fly out of the muzzle at several hundred miles an hour, but the gun only recoils backwards at a relatively slow speed? And that's because the mass of the gun is much, much greater than the mass of one bullet. So although the force is equal, the acceleration of the bullet is gonna be extremely high, but the acceleration of the gun is not gonna be very high by comparison. The other thing I wanna make note of here is um, how do these forces kind of look in free body diagrams? Um, so first of all, typically speaking, Newton's third law pair will occur in two different free body diagrams. Because notice, remember that a free body diagram only includes the forces acting on the object, not the forces exerted by that object. It's the forces acting on that object. So like, let's say we have, let's say this guy is object A and this guy is object B. A third law pair might be that object A exerts a force in object B in this direction. Let's call that F subscript AB because it's the force of A on B. The third law pair for that, first of all, is gonna be in object A's free body diagram because it's gonna be a force on object A. So typically, the two parts of the third law pair don't appear in the same free body diagram, the same F equals MA equations. That's why Newton's third law doesn't mean that like, well, if everything has an equal and opposite force, why don't all the forces just cancel out all the time? How can anything ever accelerate if everything, every force has an equal and opposite force? And the answer is because the forces can be on different objects. So if A exerts a force on B as shown, then the, for, the other third law pair for that is going to be a force of B on A, which looks like that. It's on object A, so it appears in A's free body diagram, and it's opposite in direction and equal in magnitude. So that's how a third law pair kind of looks schematically when you're solving F equals MA problems. Um, anything else I needed to say about this? I think that covers the kind of conceptual side of Newton's third law. I'll do a separate video for solving problems when Newton's third law comes into play.